Thank you for listening to Beth Harashim, the House of Artisans podcast. Here is this week's message from Chris John Otto. As you notice, these are kind of strange readings today. The readings themselves are good, but they're cut in odd ways, really odd ways. So I really struggled today about what to teach on because there was too much. There were too many things and everything was out of context. It, one of the things that was really surprising to me as I studied today was that everything you heard today is very familiar. This Hebrews chapter 11 is very familiar to most people. So is this passage in Luke, which is repeated almost verbatim in Luke's gospel and Matthew's gospel. And of course, because I'm on the road, I decided to bring my study Bible that I use, which is a scholarly version of the King James. So I was struggling reading these things because I just have other things in my head that sound more familiar to me. And so it's, it, that didn't help. But one, one of the things that was a big shock to me is that this passage that Jesus says, you know, do not worry about your life, what you will wear, what you will eat, where your treasure is, this seek first the kingdom. All of this is really in the context of being prepared for the coming of Jesus, the second coming. And that's a real surprise, I think. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And, you know, all these readings were kind of taken out of context today. And everything in Luke 12 is familiar. I love this. God is going to provide for you, just like the sparrows and like Solomon. Do not worry. Seek first the kingdom. And all these things will be added to you. Sell what you have and give it to the poor. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be. And there's this point. It all leads up to Jesus Christ is coming back. And you need to keep your focus and your attention there. Fear not, little flock. The shepherd is coming back. Your attention, your desire, and your faith has to be there. What's really interesting, and, and you know, I had... I've had some interesting conversations with other leaders recently. And they're often talking about things as if it's going to go on this way forever. And Jesus is never coming back. I find that often ministry professionals talk about church and Christianity as if Jesus is never coming back. And you live your life differently that way, I think. He, Hebrews says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the confidence in things you cannot see. Where your treasure is, there your heart is. And Abraham, in faith, put his heart in a place he couldn't see. He left his home in Ur at a time of global upheaval and went looking for a city. If you study history, there's a thing called the, the Bronze Age Collapse. And that is actually the time that Abraham lived. The city that he was living in, the civilization that he was a part of, came apart. And he left that. And he went looking for the city that Jesus went to prepare. You know, Jesus said, I've gone to prepare a place for you. And that's the city Abraham was looking for. A city where the designer and master artisan is God. It is this city and this place that Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is telling us these things so that we will be ready for him when he comes. As you know, we are in a season of radical shifting. And... Oddly enough, I kept praying about today, and I kept seeing the same picture. And it was a picture the Lord had given me a few years ago about a way forward for belonging house and, and the grid that I should use to process my ideas. 
and how I should lead through these difficult times. More and more, I've been convinced that the Lord is coming much sooner than I may have believed before. We're preparing for a city. For a city whose designer and master artisan is Jesus. And he is asking us to sell all that we have and put our trust in him. Some of us know that you've, uh, that I've done that. You know, most of my belongings I sold or gave away. And some of us need to sell our old sets of ideas. It's not just things. It's not just objects. It's the things we're holding on to. You know, I, I remember a great book I read, and they talked about, uh, it was about the Salem witch trials, and they said that the what caused the Salem witch trials was that they had problems and they had unquestioned answers. And it was those unquestioned answers that caused the deaths of 18 people. They had the answers, but they had the wrong questions. Paul and I were talking about this this week because we were talking about working with people in IT and that this is a problem in IT, that sometimes people in IT want to answer questions that nobody's asking. Prepackaged answers can get you into trouble. And a lot of the prepackaged answers we have are from another time and a different context. That doesn't mean they're wrong answers. It just means they're not the right answers for right now. So I want to share, I'm going to share a screen and share a picture with you on the podcast. You'll see it in the, the notes below. Can you see that? See the picture? It's the Star of David with paint splotched on it. And this was the picture the Lord gave me a few years ago. This picture, it's a six-pointed star of David. Interesting thing when you study design and painting is that whenever you add a triangle to a painting in design, the triangle adds two things. It adds drama and it adds tension. Triangles are more interesting than rectangles. And under pressure, a triangle is much stronger. The truss, the foundation of most engineering, is based on the triangle. And in classic Anglican thought, we were taught to form our belief on three things. Scripture, the Bible is the foundation of all belief, practice, and contains everything for faith and salvation. Tradition, this would be the Catholic part of our faith, this would be practice, this would be the sacraments, the ancient prayers, the patterns of spiritual formation given to us by the fathers and the creeds, and reason. Every new belief and practice must be reasonable. This means new revelation and practice must make sense. So this first triangle is the more static triangle as you can see it, and it intertwines with the other one. And there is strength in holding to these three components, Bible, reason, and tradition. But alone, they lead to dry, immovable faith. And this certainly is what happened to many traditional Anglican churches. They became dry and staid and reasonable, but not very exciting. 250 years ago, John Wesley added another dynamic. He said holding to the traditional elements of scripture, tradition, and reason were not enough. You were not a Christian unless you made a personal decision to come to Jesus and were personally converted. As he was, his heart was strangely warmed when he was converted. And so people today say, Wesley added experience. For those who come from Methodist and Wesleyan backgrounds, that's called the quadrilateral. Wesley didn't, never said that. Someone else said that in the 1960s. In the late 19th century, the people who followed Wesley, the Wesleyan streams of the church, began seeking a baptism of fire out of the revivals of the late 19th century. Now, this includes the Salvation Army, the Wesleyans, the Nazarenes, and a number of other churches. 
And that became what is now known as the Pentecostal movement. The Holy Spirit hit these people who were seeking gifts of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, through the charismatic and Pentecostal churches, spread through every element of the church. Suddenly, people were not just believing and having an experience of conversion. They were having a dynamic relationship with God that was accompanied by signs, wonders, and miracles. And this was something that had not happened since the apostolic age. And we're seeing the impact of that even right now, the last 125 years now. And out of that move of the Holy Spirit, was an organic movement of small groups and gatherings of people outside the structures of the institutional church. So now we have Holy Spirit and we have community and we have experience. That's the other triangle. This triangle is a living vine, like in John 15, where the water and the life of the Holy Spirit actually flows through people and their lives. Now that sounds really great, but just like in a garden, if a vine is let loose uncontrollably, it can crush other plants and it can crush itself. It has no form or, and it becomes crazy. When we lay these two triangles over one another and they intertwine, something else forms. And this is what we've got here. We've got these two trusses that are in tension. It's a star of David, an interacting strong form that holds everything in tension. As we have said many times before, truth is in the tension. And I'm more and more convinced that if we are in the kingdom and we live in the kingdom, we're going to have to learn to live in tension. And in the world that we're living in right now, this tension-based structure will help us weather the storm. So if we look at the top half of the star, you know, where the title, cut that in half, but just look at the top, you've got the Bible, Holy Spirit, and community. And that sounds really great. This is, this is what basically, these are the three elements in the independent charismatic church that emerged in the 1970s and really has its roots in the vineyard, started by John Wimber. There's a weakness here, and the weakness is that it no, it can't last longer than a generation. And I've seen this over and over again. Once the strong leader goes away, the church flounders. And what happens is the next ge generation, it sort of looks like the book of Judges. These churches are good under the initial strong leader, but after that they disintegrate into everyone does what is right in their own eyes. And for some of us who've been around, well, that's uh, an experience we've all had. The bottom half is tradition, reason, and experience. And that's really the historic Protestant denominations. Tradition becomes, we never did it that way before. Reason left alone, as Wesley said, will reason you right to hell. And experience becomes whatever the latest fad is. And when these three are left without the Holy Spirit in the Bible, it becomes a quick means of death. I mentioned last, last week that the denomination I used to work for is now 11%. Its membership is 11% of what it was when I worked for it. They've lost 89% in 15 years. And all these denominations are dying even as they continue to say they're relevant and posture themselves as authorities over others. So we're in this big shakeup. It's it really, it is, it's as, it's as big a time as the Protestant era when the church was shaken up. So when we look at this star, what we actually see are three games of tug of war that are happening. And this tension in this star is the strength. Experience alone is a road to hell. But if you take the put the Bible against your experience, the Bible is going to always bring your experience back into check. 
if you're Bible only, Bible alone, you tend to become a self-righteous jerk. I mean, maybe I'm being judgmental, but that's been my experience. Uh, I had a professor at, at Houghton who used to say, I'd rather come at, see someone coming toward me with a loaded gun than an open Bible. And there's some truth in that. Our experience is held in check by the word of God. And not all experience is God's best for you. And if you just have the Bible without anything else, you're always going to be right, but you're going to be very alone and probably unhappy. The Holy Spirit is always challenging our reason, our intellect, and our tendency to do things without God. You know, we can, we can come up with a lot of good ideas, but the Holy Spirit is going to knock us back down. And this is the beautiful thing about this is that God is in the system, actively engaged with us. The Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth. And when we get a bit too proud, the Holy Spirit will bring us back down. The Holy Spirit is always also releasing revelation and taking us past the place of intellect and reason. The living community holds tradition and tension. In every generation, the old ways and forms are forced to adjust and become real. We don't live in relics of the past. We live in an ancient house that now and again needs new paint, needs new plumbing, needs things to be repaired. But this house still has a good foundation. It's founded on the apostles and the prophets. It has solid walls and a strong roof. Our contemporary community does not have the right to just tear down a wall because they need a place for a coffee bar or whatever, linoleum on the stone walls. If you read the news, you're going to get depressed. So we always have to come back to the, the center. We've been working for years now to build a house, and this is a house made with words. And we have to be a Bible community. We have to be biblical. Can't just throw the Bible out. We have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We have to be in relationship with one another. We have to use our minds. You can't just throw your brain out especially if you're a creative professional, you have to be using your brain all the time. But we have to be honoring of everything that came before us. And, and it's got to be real. It's got to be living. It's got to be current. It's got to be what we do now. I don't know if we're going to live another 500 years before the Lord comes. I don't know if it's going to be next week. You know, there's so many things that I never thought would ever happen that are happening. And, uh, you know, I, it's you get into trouble when you say this is this is Jesus is coming back. Let's get a white robe and stand on a hill. We don't want to do that. But we have to be ready. And the things we've been struggling with, I've had this conversation with so many people lately. Struggling with what do I do? The old thing isn't working anymore. And I'm really giving thanks to God because since I've adapted the, you know, to this process that I've shared with you, these things, keeping this conscious in my writing and in my teaching, it's really bearing fruit. We're seeing a lot of fruit. And so, and we, as we break up into small groups today, let's uh, just chat about this and pray about it and uh, see what the Lord wants to do. Uh, Val had a beautiful picture this morning when we were talking at breakfast that God wants to really rebuild this house, bring the house back. He's taken us through a, sh a sharp pruning, but it looks like new growth is in the air. And so let's keep that in mind. Father, we bless you today. We thank you for all that you're doing, that you're you're causing us to work things out new ways and not leaving the old ways behind. We thank you, Lord, for your reasonableness and giving us your mind, Lord, to help us process the world we live in. And we, we just ask, Lord, that you would...
continue to raise us up to be wise and deep and smart and filled with your Holy Spirit so that we can build a throne for you on the earth and also build a pathway for people to come to Jesus, a roadway in the wilderness. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message from Beth Harashim, The House of Artisans. If you would like to know more about Chris John Otto and Belonging House Fellowship, please go to our website, belongginghouse.org.